Welcome to the second session of uh, conference. Uh, so please uh, welcome Stéphane uh, from Groupon, who uh, senior Android developer, uh, will talk about bytecode integration. And uh, that's all. Have fun. A new approach to common problems. Uh, Can you share me without microphone? Uh, yeah. That's so much. That's, that's so good. Okay. So we're going to talk about bytecode weaving for Android and so libraries to make it easier. We're going to see that there is even now a full stack that has been built um, to ease making uh, bytecode weaving inside your own libraries to even create Gradle or Maven plugins for your libraries. And we will see what it gives to use them in apps. So I'm going to start uh, by a short presentation and short bio. So my name is Stefan Nicola. Um, I'm actually working for Groupon, as I said earlier. Um, I maintain a few libraries uh, on GitHub. The, my favorite one is maybe RoboSpice. It's a network-related library, kind of equivalent to Volley, except that it was a precursor of Volley. Um, and also Boundbox, that is um, a library that you can use for testing the private state uh, of objects or classes uh, on Android or Java at large. Uh, you can find me on GitHub, Stack Overflow, and Google+. I don't tweet and I don't Facebook. Um, so as I said, I'm working for Groupon, and we are actively recruiting. So if you're interested to work for Groupon in San Francisco, you can apply to this URL. And we are actively looking for good developers. Uh, very skillful developers. So if you're interested, just let me know and we can contact you further on. Well, before uh, talking about how we can perform by code weaving on Android, let's say we're going to start with an example uh, of what we can do with that. So our goal will be to log to log all the lifecycle methods uh, of an activity, for instance. So usually when you are programming with Android, there is a lot of lifecycle you have to deal with, fragments, services, activities, and it can turn out to be complex on some platforms, some devices, and if you want to know what's happening inside your apps, then it would be useful to be able to log all these events, all these uh, hook methods. So let's say we got, um, we can use a bytecode weaving based library called Log Lifecycle. It's actually a GitHub project, so you can find it here. It's pretty mature and stable, production ready. So to use it, you're going to see it's quite simple. All you, have, all you got to do inside your Gradle build file is to apply this plugin, Log Lifecycle. That's it, no more configuration. And when you want to see the Log Lifecycle methods, to, to log them into the Logcat, then you just have to annotate your activities. So it works for services, fragments, uh, broadcast managers, and so on and so on. So you just annotate it. And when the plugin log, log life cycle for Gradle will detect the annotation at log life cycle, then it will inject all the bytecode that is necessary to log the, the method. So you end up with something like this inside your logcat. Here you can see we grep on log life cycle. And so you can see all the methods have been logged automatically for you. So the only thing you had to do is to say that you use the plugin and to annotate your activities. There is no more line of code needed for that. So that's just an example of how powerful uh, this technology can be. Of course, logging lifecycle methods is not very useful per se for itself, but here is an, just an illustration of this, the power of this technique. So here is the presentation plan, plan for today, uh, maybe hurrying up a bit because we don't have much time. So we're going to start a bit about the concepts of bytecode weaving on Android, why it's different uh, with uh, Java bytecode manipulation. And then we will go to into the specifics of Android. And after that, I will present a, a few libraries that are based on these technologies. Um, as you can see, there are more and more uh, libraries coming out. You will see this in the end. So what is bytecode weaving? Bytecode weaving, as defined by Oracle or Sun, 
um, is a technique for changing the bytecode of compiled Java classes. So I guess most of you knew that, but it's good to have a formal definition to start with. Indeed, there are two ways to weave bytecode on a GVM. The first one is called dynamic bytecode weaving. It means that we are going to weave bytecode at runtime. So Java classes are going to be intercepted prior to being loaded by the class loader. And while we intercept them, then we change the bytecode. That's one way to do it. The second one is static bytecode weaving, and we can do this at post-compilation time. So it means that once we got our classes compiled through JavaC, Java, the Java compiler, then during the build process, we can modify the bytecode. Dynamic bytecode weaving is, so as I said, is, uh, is done at runtime prior to the class being loaded by the class loader. And to do achieve that, inside the GVM, there is even an API um, that defines what we call a Java agent, the entity that will be responsible for intercepting the, the classes before they are really loaded by the class loader. And this API is a standard API. It's part of the Java language specification. And you can see it's defined by mostly two classes and one interface. So the first one is a class transformer, and the second one is an instrumentation. So as you can see, it's quite straightforward, even very, yeah, very straightforward to define new agents. There are almost no changes required to the build. You just have your normal build process, but you're going to add a little string to say that, oh, when I run my program, I want to uh, add a Java agent that will be responsible for weaving bytecode. The problem is that it degrades performance this way because you have to run two entities, one GVM, one Java agent, then you got to manipulate the bytecode at runtime, and on Android, we're looking for performances. So that's not the way to do it. Furthermore, there is a second problem, is that on Dalvik or Art, there are no Java agents. So it's not possible to use this technology. The closest thing that we can use in Android is kind of a Java agent, is called an instrumentation. I'm pretty sure that you all meet this class before. Um, an instrumentation is used, for instance, when you are creating tests. You have to add a, a very tiny line into your manifest. I, I think most of you know that. So if we look at what an, uh, an instrumentation can do in Android, it's defined by a simple API. Globally, we're just mimicking or following the flow of the life cycle of the methods of activities. So there is one method inside an instrumentation that will be called prior to calling on create inside a given activity. So we pass the instrumentation, the activity that's going to be created. So it gives you an opportunity to change the class when uh, on create is run. Same for on destroy, on pause, on resume, on recreate, and so on. So, as you can see, there is only one method that um, uh, is um, related to applications. All the other ones are related to activities, and that's it. So the problem we have with instrumentation is that it's, it has many limitations. The first one is that it's very activity-centric, so it doesn't give you the opportunity to manipulate every kind of class of Android. For example, views, they can't be manipulated by instrumentation. They are not code at all by instrumentations. Furthermore, it will slow down your applications. So when testing, it doesn't really matter. But when executing your application on a phone, then yes, it does matter. So we can just alter the behavior before or after a hook method, like on create. So it means that, for instance, we can't use this in instrumentation to um, inject all the views that are inflated by XML. Let's say you want to just simply annotate them with at inject view, and you would like to do the injection instead of the programmer, instead of the developer, then you can't do it with an instrumentation. You don't have any hook to plug into. So it's less powerful than a Java agent. Let's see what is the alternative. So the alternative is to use post compilation on Android. And indeed, there are two options. I don't know if most of you are familiar with the, the build process of an Android application. So here is a simplified schema of how an application is built on Android. Um, as you can see, there are two places where you can actually manipulate a Java program. The first one is before the Java compiler compiles the classes and we actually use this technology for annotation processing. I'm pretty sure that most of you use um, libraries like maybe Butterknife that use annotation processors. So this is where they hook inside the build process. And the second option is to perform manipulations around dexing, so either before dexing or after dexing. 
Next thing being the conversion from Java classes format, the standard GVM class files, to the Dalvik or Art class files. So, excuse me. So here we got two solutions to manipulate the bad codes and to weave the bytecodes, as I told uh, just earlier. So after compilation, uh, compilation by JAVAC and before DEXing or after DEXing. As we will see, solution two would require to manipulate DEX files. And actually, we have chosen um, the first option because it's easier and we can use a lot of tools that already exist, are already implemented, are quite standard. So the solution one offers a greater compatibility and I will detail it. So when we're using post-compilation bytecode weaving, we can use a standard library. It is a standard and de facto standard, quite used, uh, quite wide used in, uh, in the Java world. It's called Java Assist. Actually, Java Assist is being used in a in a huge amount of libraries like JBoss, GPA implementations. We will see this further on. And so for Gradle, there is a plugin that we can use during the build process to manipulate bytecode. It's called Java Assist Gradle plugin. You can find it on GitHub. And there is exactly the same one for people who would like to still use Maven to modify their, to build their Android applications. So as you can see, there is one inconvenience, is that uh, we highly depend on the build tools. But I've been working with the guys that do both plugins, and to name them because they worked hard on it. Uh, here is uh, the plugin made by Daryl Tio, a very good programmer, looking for a job, parenthesis. And um, this one has been made by Roland Bartel, um, a guy in Germany who's got a job. <laughs> so. We have been working together, uh, all the three, to uh, try to, um, to make it easier to use the same transformations of bytecode inside both plugins, inside both words, both Gradle and Maven. So we decided to define a common API. We even submitted it to Java Assist, so it may become quite soon part of the Java Assist standard API. So we define transformations very easily. The first one is a filtering method. Should I transform this class or not? And the second one is that if you answer yes, this method will be called, then apply the transformation. So with this very simple API, we can define every kind of transformation to manipulate every kind of classes in Java or in Android. So the advantage is that we can now use the same transformations in both Gradle and Maven builds. If you look at Java Assist, maybe it's not very well known in the Android world, but quite known in the Java world. So as I told you, it's quite a standard. And actually, the API of Java Assist are very close to reflection. So they are very easy to manipulate if you are a little bit familiar with reflection, which is not very complicated. It is far, far, far simpler than using an annotation processor API. I don't know if some of you already tried to create an annotation processor, but it's really very, very difficult. Um, so it's widely used, it has been widely tested, you can use it even, I think you even use it daily if you test your application, for instance, because both uh, EasyMark and Mokito use them. So even on Android, we already use Java Assist. Um, as I told you, it works with everything that interprets Java bytecode, so it will work on a Dalvik, on Art, on JVM, quite good. On a JVM is important too, so it means that even if you use RoboElectric for testing, it will work too. And the only drawback is that it's not been designed for the Java world, so it cannot manipulate DEX files. That's why we're going to hook just before DEXing, because it can manipulate class files. But someone has started to fork um, recently Java Assist to make it capable of um, modifying the DEX files. So maybe soon it can change a bit. Okay, um, as we are, have very short time, I suggest that we postpone the demos a little bit in the end, if we got some remaining time. <coughs> so here are two examples of libraries that you can use, just demonstrations of what we can do with bytecode manipulation. Let's say you got a template class like this one with a constructor that just logs, okay, I'm inside the constructor, and defines a simple method, do stuff, that logs, I'm inside do stuff. And now you want to define your own class here, example, with an inheritance link, single inheritance in Java, so you decide that you will inherit from ancestor. If you use a simple annotation at mimic, 
and you define this, the template class to use. Then, using the bytecode weaving manipulations, we will inject all the code that is defined here in the template class, provided inside the annotation parameters, and we will inject everything inside this class. So it's kind of a way to bypass single inheritance limitations in Java. I, I, someone who is very uh, knowledgeable told me it's some kind of uh, traits implementation in Java. So here, as a result, if you instantiate now the new example I, uh, object, you call new example dot do stuff, then you will see that calling the constructor will log I'm inside the constructor, and calling do stuff will call I'm inside do stuff. But there is no such code in your own class. It's just acquired. This behavior is acquired by mimicking the template that is here. So mimic is really some kind of templating by code injection. So you can just define one class with the behavior you want and inject this behavior in every class you want, whatever the inheritance uh, of the, the destination target. That's just an example. And um, we can dig even a bit more if you're not very satisfied with this coarse grain approach of injecting every method and we don't know exactly where it's going to be injected. Then you can even refine a bit and decide that one method can be injected at the beginning of a method and so on and so on. So I'm just going quick to pass the details. Okay. So you're wondering, but why the hell I'm, I'm going to do that? I mean, I never needed such a thing. But indeed, it can be practical in some cases. For instance, if you use RoboJuice, I don't know if there are many users of RoboJuice here. RoboJuice 2 or 3, yeah, some, not so many. So in RoboJuice, you got an Android frame. It's based on the Android framework, for sure. You got a class that's called RoboActivity. So RoboActivity is the main class for RoboJuice. And when you want to use RoboJuice, then you extend a RoboActivity in your own activity class. And this class is quite nice. It offers a lot of features, dependence injection, view injection, and so on. But it turns out to be a bit complicated when you look at what happens on Android, because the platform is quite fragmented, and there are many classes, actually, that can be used as base classes for Android activities. For instance, you got the RoboFragment activity in support, uh, the robo action bar activity, robo list activity, and so on and so on. And indeed, if you look at the code inside these activities, these classes, they all have the exact same code as a robo activity. The exact same code. Not a single one is changed. The only difference is the super class, nothing else. So if you want to use them in your own application, you've got to choose the right class to extend from. And then it turns that you will inherit the behavior. But indeed, what you wanted is just the behavior that's in the robo activity. You, are, you get something specific just because of the multiple classes defined in the Android framework. If we use Mimic, then we could create something a bit different. Actually, we're going to do it in RoboJuice 4 because uh, RoboJuice is maintained at Groupon. So um, if you look at, so you want to create, uh, you want to inject the behavior of robo activity. So what you will do in RoboJuice 4 is that whatever the class you choose to extend from, maybe a robo list activity, robo fragment activity, whatever, you will just annotate it with at robo activity and you will receive all the code that is inside robo activity. It will be used as a template and it will be injected inside your own classes. So you don't have to worry about being an activity of this type or this type or this type. And for us, our library maintainers, it will mean that we will have only one class to maintain robo activity and not a ton of classes with just different super classes. So when we fix one bug, we had to fix it in like 15 classes. Now we got to fix it in one. So it's going to be easier. Here is another example of what we can do with uh, bytecode manipulation. So we saw a templating system. Now we're going to see a fluent API. So uh, here is an inst uh, a very straightforward example. I think everyone can see the value of it on Android. So let's say you got your own class that says my activity, and you got a few views inside. You want to annotate those views in the same way as we do with butter knife, indeed. So at inject view, text view, at inject view, button, button. So this feature already works in RoboJuice 2, and it will work in RoboJuice 3. But in RoboJuice 4, we're going to do it by a bytecode manipulation, because it performs better, just better. And it's simpler to write, simpler to test, and so on. So what we want is that if when you are going to write your own activity, whatever you choose to extend from, uh, except nothing, 
So you choose an activity class to extend from. So during your onCreate method, you just call super.onCreate as usual. And what we will do is that you, we will inject some code here at this place after the super.onCreate call or after the set content view call. And then we will inject the views that are being inflated via XML. And we will, do, we will perform this operation for you. So we just take out the IDs inside your layout and uh, issue the find view by ID statements. That's just an example. So this will not uh, crash because there is a null pointer exception. So you can directly use your button and directly use your text views. They will be injected here, transparently for you. If we look at what Afterburner looks like, you can use it as a fluent API, as I told you. So to define this kind of transformation, it's quite straightforward, I think very readable. So you can say to your builder to insert into the class, the class to transform. In the method on create if it exists, after a call to set content view, you can inject the body of a method that is defined maybe dynamically. You will read the, the, the fields that are annotated with at inject view. And then if this method exists, we will inject this body inside the onCreate method after the call to, soup, to um, set content view. And if the method doesn't exist, then we will create one for you and perform the same injection of the same body here. So with this simple um, library, with this simple fluent syntax, you can manipulate um, Java classes arbitrarily and perform any kind of operations you want. So it turns out that if we could standardize all those uh, injection manipulations and bytecode weaving, we could even achieve something that would be quite interesting. Um, I don't know if most of you are familiar with the, the Java specification request process. So it's, it's a quite an interesting process, very democratic, that Sun put in place a few years ago so that developers can add some extensions, some request of specification to extend the platform and enhance it. But in Android, there is no such specification request. So maybe we could try to achieve um, a new bunch of specification requests to give meaning to special annotations so that developers can just use these annotations and directly we will provide an implementation to inject the bytecode where it's needed. So that could be interesting and could give maybe yeah, more openness to the Android platform. So we could do the same for at inject view in the same way as butter knife and robot juice do it, except that we would not even have a one line template, or one line boulder plate code to write to call butter knife or to call robot juice. We could just perform the, the operation transparently and provide different implementations that user, that developers could choose from just by using search or such um, a Gradle plugin inside their, their build.gradle files. So we could do that for at inject view for injection, dependency injection, true dependency injection, like Dagger, Dagger2, or RoboJuice. We could do also this kind of stuff for um, uh, event passes, to pass messages, messages from entities to other entities inside of a Java and Android application, like communication between activities, or communication between fragments, or application and fragments, and so on, to services. We could even go a bit further. I don't know if you know the Two libraries, Memento and iSpeak. They have been developed by two different uh, developers, Matthias Kepler and um, Jackie Sardo, I think, from England. So both of them deal with the statefulness of uh, some fields. So Memento is dedicated to active fields, like threads or connection managers, for instance. And iSpeak will just keep the state, a bit like uh, what Cyril Moti explained to us a few minutes ago. So both of them deal with state conservation inside activities, but we could enhance this system and provide an annotation that you would just annotate a field and we would inject all the bytecode that is needed because it's just a boilerplate. So we don't, write to, we don't want to write this. There is no interest in writing this. It's error prone, it takes a long time. In the same way, we, Hugo, I don't know if you know this library from Jake Wharton. So Hugo actually uses bytecode manipulation, bytecode weaving by using um, aspect programming. So it's kind of same technology. We could even um, create new libraries that would directly in inject inside your POJOs code to deserialize or serialize from JSON or XML directly into the POJOs. So you don't have to care about any aspect of dealing with JSON or XML. It would be done automatically for you. Even the call to deserialize could be done automatically. 
So, and the advantage of this technique is that, okay, you don't see the code that is injected, but if you trust it because it's well built, bug free, like used massively in production, then you can say, okay, it works, and I don't want to see that code. It's not very interesting to see generated code or boilerplate code. And the advantage is that this code can be very tuned, very optimized. And we just add inside your application, not a whole library to perform the serialization or those operations, but we just add the few lines of byte code that you would have injected manually. So, for instance, if you, lose, if you use the uh, log lifecycle library, we don't add any dependency to your application. We just add a few lines of byte code, byte code. that's it. So there is no extra weight, no extra library, you know, extra dependency to deal with. We just add exactly what you want, nothing else. That's a good advantage, and it performs very well. If you want to have a look, there is a, uh, a project that you can find here. Actually, it's like um, some kind of war room for these technologies. So it's on github.com slash Stefan Nicolas, my name, and then slash injects with an S, plural. And this page actually sums up all the work that is being done out of bytecode weaving, all the state of the art of all the libraries that are based on those technologies. And you can see that we've created a full stack, so we have implemented a, a, a common API for Gradle and Maven plugins, then enhanced the Gradle plugins, then even defined some new plugin layer just for Android and to ease creating new layers. And then we've defined a few libraries that use all this stack. So we already have inject view and inject fragment working. So they work pretty well. They are production ready. Uh, inject resource. So in the same way as you inject view, you could inject resources from your REST folder. We can even inject extras that are passed from one activity to another. Okay. And um, yeah, we are actually thinking of enhancing those libraries and enriching them. So if you got any ideas, just have a look. We are pretty open to contributions. And you will see that it's quite easy to define new libraries and even to extend the DSL we provided. So it can be very easy to use for developers. Um, well, we got like four minutes left. Yeah. yeah. So maybe I can show you quickly what, um, yeah, what this looks like to use. Uh, let's say I'm going to use it. Oof. I need to find a project in a new window. Can you see something? Yeah, almost. Okay, what does it look like to use one of these libraries that are using bytecode injection or bytecode manipulation? So here inside your own application, this is a build.gradle file. You will just have to add one line inside the, the class path section of the build script section of the build.gradle files. So here I will show you full screen maybe. Yeah, no, that's good. So you just add this line to say, oh, okay, I want to use the inject view plugin for Gradle. That's it. Then when you will need the plugin, you will just say apply plugin inject view. That's it. No more configuration is needed. The rest is just to develop this plugin and example. And then inside your own application, you can use the at inject view annotations very easily. So you see here, we say at inject view of a field from my own XML layout. We just inject the view and we directly use it. There is no code related to actually picking up the, the view from XML and putting this inside this field. This is performed automatically. So it's very, very easy to use. Indeed, we do a lot of stuff inside those plugins. We apply a few transformations. We even add some dependencies to your projects transparently, just so that you can use the annotations. You still need, you need to use that. So we just add a few classes to your jars to uh, uh, this class indeed, just an, one annotation. It's like maybe 30 bytes in bytecode, so not that much. And then we will perform the injection for you and you can directly use your, use your views after set content view and that's it. You don't have to worry about where do I find this resource or whatever, whatever. And you can even use um, at nullable or at optional. 
so that if you got different layouts from your XML for different configurations, let's say landscape or portrait, then maybe the view won't be found by at injection time, and you can say that okay, by default it has to be found, but if you say at nullable, then it may be skipped. Maybe the the, the view doesn't exist, and so there is no crash. You just tell the API, okay, maybe this view won't exist. That's it. So it's quite easy to use. So indeed, the whole idea of this presentation, of this session, um, oh, what did I do? Not very familiar with Keynote. Okay. So the whole idea of this session is to introduce bytecode weaving as some kind of new technology that can be used inside libraries, even in standard libraries or kind of standard, like button knife. Maybe we could add a plugin to button knife just to perform the button knife injection automatically for you, so you don't have to care about using button knife. So the idea is really to try to remove all boilerplate from our applications. And we hope so that we can just code what is worth coding, because inflation of views is not very exciting. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, any questions, any comments? <laughs>
kind of compiles all the combines all the advantages of annotation processing and by code weaving. So let's see what how this evolves. Yeah. Yes, coming back to debugging. Yeah. When you have injected all the all those lines of codes and yeah. you have a bug, and mm -hmm. you you get the the stack trace, which is not the one you have in your source code. How do you cope with the uh, reverse engineering of, uh, of that's what you the, have been? That's the killing question, <laughs> really. No, what happens is that when you uh, insert code with Java Assist, you can um, actually uh, rename or renumber the lines of code that you insert. You could do that, but it would change all the lines of code, and so there would be no real. Um, um, it would be very difficult to establish a link between uh, a line of code that bugs and your own code. So what we do is that we just use the same line of code number. So it, let's say your set content view is line 51. So at line 51, you will have set content view, and then all the injected stuff will say, I'm on line 51 too. So we do that. The idea is that we don't want to find any bugs because it's super hard to debug. So to avoid that, what we do is that if you look at all the projects we are maintaining, um, poof, yeah, I got a very bad. Okay, just give me one second. Oh, I don't even have to go back. Yeah, it's gonna be more visible. <laughs> so, actually, what we do is that uh, we test a lot. There is continuous integration setup, even code coverage. So we're pretty sure that we got the fewer bugs that we, that we can. And what we do is that we have very sharpened libraries. They are very specific, like injecting views. So what we, we try to accomplish is to keep this sharpness so that our libraries are easy to maintain. They are over-tested. We test every case, every aspect. We got like 89, 88, 87 percent of coverage, so we're quite sure there is no bug in what we do, or very few, and we will go on with this kind of coverage so that we can provide a very good quality or insurance to uh, or guarantee to the, the people that are going to use these libraries. But actually, creating fine view by IDs is not so difficult. So it should be possible that around maybe a couple of iterations, there is no bug at all and no need for maintenance anymore. We hope so. But actually, I think we're pretty close already. Other question? Thank you very much. Thank you.